Boom! Lego logos? Cool ass baseline. The computerized percussion arrives and you realize, this soundtrack has some really exciting stuff. In fact, the music in this movie happens to absolutely bang. It's well produced, it accompanies the film perfectly, and it's both adorably retro and genuinely cool modern sci-fi. The music and visuals are both deeply adventurous but still principal. Speaking of the visuals, the whole thing looks absolutely bonkers. The attention to detail at hand is almost maniacal. So much knowledge of the intricacies of LEGO was poured into this film. The result? It's an absolute joy to watch. This one can hold my attention much better than the other LEGO movies because they use every opportunity at hand to tell a joke or otherwise show something visually entertaining. Unlike more recent big budget toy movies, the money was clearly spent almost entirely on making the film good. The script and story and jokes are all just so amazingly well groomed, the communication skills alone deserve serious credit. Despite being a blatant advertisement, the movie pulls an equally blatant fuck you to the studio and the corporatism thereof with immense style and self-awareness. Throughout the movie, corporations are treated like the unspeakably evil entities that they are. Still, the experience fills you with an incurable sense of childlike wonder, not to mention the absolutely stacked cast, whose performances, by the way, all slap. Thankfully, it's also damn stupid. Perfect tone for a kid's movie. Traditionally, the genre calls for preachy, morally grandstanding tosh, which the Lego movie conspicuously and graciously ignores. While I think the first half of the movie is more philosophically interesting because of its critique of modernity, it's never boring. The second half just feels like a perfectly orchestrated adventure. The film spends its runtime wonderfully. Dillying, dalliance, and claptrap is kept to an absolute minimum. They smartly spend no time on Lord Business getting the craggle at the beginning because it wouldn't be interesting. Speaking of that setup, it's absolutely amazing. Not only does it introduce the fantastic door opening killing two people bit, it completely subverts the audience's expectations. When Vitruvius pulls up his cool ass Lego birds, the audience are expecting a long ass fight scene. Instead, your robots are no match for a master builder, for I see everything. <laughs> My eyes. Complete anti-climax. Why make a meal out of it? In the prophecy, the line A special one with face of yellow is obviously nonsense. Nearly all Lego figures are yellow, but the special is meant to be ordinary. A special one? What a bunch of hippy dippy baloney. Eight and a Half is an Italian art film about the search for meaning through the lens of filmmaking. The struggle with which Emmett finds his own self makes this feel like an appropriate reference. While Fellini views filmmaking from a very individualistic standpoint, I feel the Lego movie takes a much more communitarian approach. I would classify it as a kind of communist manifesto for multiple reasons. Emmett is almost archetypal working class. Lord Business is stereotypical ruling class. It tells us, in no uncertain terms, that we must band together as people if any good is to be done. This is not to say that the movie thinks problems will cease to exist once our society is more equal, rather collective ownership is the only way a society can be organized morally. I understand that for some people, this movie being an advert kind of guts it of a socialist message. If that's you, I would invite you to consider otherwise. Is the message of this movie that we need to build our own businesses, that we should compete, that other people are just NPCs in your story? No! The film is straight up telling you that capitalism is evil, that the world is for everyone, and we must work together to build a better one. Elaborating on the theme of the special being ordinary, welcome to Emmett's apartment. Look at all the products! This is where these master builders' world building and environmental storytelling skills shine particularly brightly. The world of Bricksburg prioritizes conformity above all else. Conform! It's the norm! Integrate! It's integrate. You are instructed what to do, but being non-instructed gets you disappeared, put to sleep. In the first act, Emmett is the embodiment of ignorance being bliss. His apartment contains no personal objects, they're all mass-produced posters and toothbrushes and bicycles. The movie presents a twist on the Socratic paradox. I know that I am not special. Emmett is meant to be the ultimate everyman, the most unspecial person, and this affords him the opportunities that ultimately make him THE special. Emmett. Don't worry about what the others are doing. You must embrace what is special about you. <gasps> Touching the piece represents gaining consciousness. With Emmett, this is both in a figurative and a literal sense. Firstly, there's the process of learning to think for yourself. Emmett is forced to learn how to become his own person when he's seemingly irrevocably craggled to a seemingly irreplaceable, unique object. Secondly, 
Emmett becomes enlightened, at least a little bit. The vision he has shows his eyes opening fully for the first time. Emmett, however briefly, experiences reality for what it actually is. That, of course, being the world around us humans. This is not just metaphysically materialistic, it's dialectically materialistic. Lastly, gaining consciousness is a meta-reference to one of the true intentions of the film, make children class conscious. In both the real and Lego world, we face the guarantee of total destruction if we do not take action, and the cataclysmic stakes at hand are communicated perfectly by the movie. Emmett has no people in his life, but he's content, right? Emmett smiles, but he's not happy. His enthusiasm is the replacement for deep emotional connections with people and a personality of his own. It seems that every person he meets has something special about them, but not him. This is the very thing that allows him to achieve greatness. He has no copes to cling on to. He has no choice but to accept his fate. The film presents the dichotomy of whether or not being blissfully unaware is preferable to waking up and taking action. The film argues that true happiness comes from the latter. It will hurt, but it's preferable to the alternative. You must be willing to suffer in the pursuit of true happiness, which comes from responsibility, love, and community. There's a painful sadness to the pre-peace place in Emmett's arc. Even though his loneliness is mostly played for laughs, it's still completely crushing. His double-decker couch, his one original idea, it only works with friends. Lord Business, acting in the capacity of President Business, reminds the people that he is president of both the Octan Corporation, the company that owns everything, and the entire world. Thankfully, he does it with a smile on his face and distracts people well enough with free tacos and saying the loud part out quiet. Let's take extra care to follow the instructions or you'll be put to sleep. And then, of course, a state-created comedy show to prevent people from having too much to think. Tonight on Where Are My Pants... Honey... Where are my pants? <laughs> the logo, line delivery, and accompanying laugh track for Where Are My Pants are just impeccable. Also, she's dusting your pants, you fucking charlatan. The main restriction Lord Business puts on the citizens of Bricksburg is their creativity. They are disallowed from making something that shows too much personality and therefore non-conformity. Citizens are only allowed to build if they're instructed to build. The instructions are the urbanites' replacement for religion. Everyone pays rent to the Octan Corporation, not just with their money, but with their souls. The I've got my eye on you billboard is a fairly explicit reference to 1984, being almost identical to the Big Brother is watching you propaganda poster. Misery is not tolerated in Bricksburg. Smile, everyone else is. Step nine, eat a complete breakfast with all the special people in your life. A croissant and a waffle is not a complete breakfast, you incoherent fool. Everything is awesome while being an objective banger is a horrifying representation of how popular media can be used to enforce the status quo. The line, when you're living a dream, is an allusion to illusion. The people survive but do not live. They remain shrouded in darkness for their entire existence. The themes of the song are fairly cut and dry in my opinion. The lyrics are just hilariously sinister. If you lose your job, that's your problem. Smile. It's also the only music that's allowed to exist. Variations of it are the only thing that play in Octan HQ and also everywhere else. I think the Lonely Island feature and general tone, as well as the incredibly hokey chord progression and lyrics, get across the ironic nature of the song. Parts of it remind me of socialist realism, where art was forced by the state to be awash with mindless positivity, meaningless jingoism, and propaganda. While the song is a criticism of conformity and capitalism, it mounts suspicion against any entity that claims all is well. Perfect music for a 16-lane highway. The driving scene features so many cool and telling posters and billboards. Not only is it clear that these are the rules kids hate, but they also represent social demands that keep people trapped within their ways. One enforces colouring inside the lines. One demands the curfew be obeyed. One encourages people to accept defeat. Like the totalitarian regime of Lord Business, the Nazis held tight control over the media. Art was required to honour Hitler, censorship was rife, and any dissenting or foreign voices were brutally suppressed in order to create a bubble, an ideological echo chamber. In this context, entertainment is weaponized to further the intentions of the regime. Lord Business's physical appearance emphasizes how this character is both intimidating and pathetic, requiring constant validation from his lackeys. Like Ben Shapiro, 
Law business must wear lifts. While his gait is undoubtedly one of a brutal dictator, he is still very easily manipulated by feeling uncool. In the instruction sequence, Emmett starts telling you them rapid fire so you don't notice ones like Read the headlines! Not read the newspaper. You are told exactly what you need to know. Whether or not it's true is irrelevant. That's $37. Awesome! The $37 price tag of the coffee is only going to sound less ridiculous every year. That'll be $42. The builder's instructions are to take everything weird and blow it up! And so away the non-conforming living spaces go. This is something the US did and continually does to low-income black neighborhoods. After we see the aforementioned billboard, we immediately see a surveillance camera. Citizens are watched at all hours by the militarized robot police force, but I'm sure that's not a metaphor. Bricksburg is a dystopia with a very, very carefully crafted image of a utopia. Emmett, despite being told to ignore anything weird he hears, says, I think I heard a whoosh. He did indeed. Some poor sound designer probably spent months fine-tuning that because it sounds like the whooshiest whoosh ever. It's more important than that, though. This is when Emmett starts to trust his senses over the instructions. People are heavily encouraged to snitch on each other. All strange activity, non-conformity, must be reported immediately to the super-secret police. Thankfully, Emmett and Wildstyle are prevented from being sent to Room 101, through the power of heterosexuality. Along with the excellent visual comedy, the scene of Emmett falling through the construction site reminds me of the treacherous journey out of Plato's cave. It's painful being ejected from your comfortable ignorance, and you will be tempted to run back. However, there is no other way but forward, unreal though your journey may seem. The piece of resistance, which is an excellent pun, is arranged in a throne-like position. What is that? And then he says, What do I do? I don't have my instructions. This is the first time that Emmett has to make a decision for himself. Thinking and making decisions for yourself is a skill that's hard for. The piece kind of reminds me of the bagel from Everything Everywhere All at Once. It's a representation of absolute truth and the madness thereof. Emmett gives a completely voluntary interview to the cops, or the cop. The good cop, bad cop strategy is a well-established tool of psychological manipulation. Not to get the truth, but to get a confession. The surveillance technology, of course, designates him a liar. Polygraphs, despite being completely unreliable, are still somehow used by police and government. One of the robot cops is playing solitaire. To hammer home that Bricksburg is a complete corporatocracy, Emmett beams with enthusiasm for Lord Business and the Octan Corporation. President Business is going to end the world? But he's such a good guy. In Octan, they make good stuff. Music, dairy products, coffee, TV shows, surveillance systems, all history books, voting machines. Wait a minute. However, it is here when the mask of corporate idealism begins to slip. Emmett is forced to realize through no action of his own. Hey, not so special anymore, huh? <laughs> well, guess what? No one ever told me I was special. I never got a trophy just for showing up. I'm not some special little snowflake. No, but as unspecial as I am, you are a thousand billion times more unspecial than me. Bad Cop obviously thinks he's guilty and will accept no other explanation. The perspective shot of the melting chamber is really impressive. The combat in this movie is awesome. Super cartoony, but incredibly precise and lively. It's filled to the brim with excitement and vigor and is equal parts technical marvel and spectacle. It's worth noting that while Good Cop is nice, he still says, Hi everybody! How's, How's the, the melting going? going? He's still directly contributing to the mechanisms of the state, as nearly everyone does. Especially considering his parents are both cops, he feels like he has no choice. Wrong, though he knows his work is. The carnage going around Emmett and Wildstyle while she's monologuing is absolutely hilarious. The robot specifically places down a chair so Bad Cop can kick it into its crotch. I also love the scream that Pratt does. <laughs> Like everyone, Emmett aspires to be special, but since the instructions and everything about his livelihood prevent any sort of self-expression, he immediately clings onto anything that makes him feel special. Not everyone can become a great artist, but a great artist can come from anywhere. The city limits, despite there being little to no physical boundaries, have a barrage of signs to stop people from leaving. It's no physical boundary, it's just the law. The prophecy never said anything about the special being competent, smart, or even brave. 
Wildstyle assumes the special must be a master builder, and part of her arc means putting away her previous assumptions about who can do good. Emmett fails to comprehend the exposition with the power of misogyny. The mass arrest of the master builders reflects the tactic fascist regimes use of killing or imprisoning intellectuals. The people who refuse to be led by the nose by the state must be suppressed. The walls erected by President Business are borders. People are free to mingle and build, but only with the permission of the asshole who owns the slice of the world you live in. The Octan office building is so hilarious. There is not a hint of subtlety to the evil corporation angle. Bar the human actors, every worker at the company is literally a robot. The human actors, by the way, are just as much mindless corporate drones as the other bastards. We've done some great work over the years together, bad cop. Capturing all those master builders and torturing them and whatnot. Thank you, sir. Although, you did let the piece of resistance go, the one thing that can ruin my plans, the one thing that I asked you to take care of. <laughs> That's super frustrating. The thin veil of friendliness he puts on is very funny. He really does put his whole feral Lucy into this persona. He has leagues and leagues of robots serve him in everything he does. A robot to hand him his coffee, one to catch his cup when he throws it. A robot to roll out the carpet, and one to sweep immediately after he walks on it. The company is also very well named. Octan sounds like the most corporation that has ever existed. Bad Cop's teeth sliding around on the window as Lord Business pushes him into it is so good. Those obsessed with order like Lord Business believe the world should be frozen in place, the metaphysical extreme of conservatism. This would signify the end of change and therefore the end of the world. Those who cannot adapt to change try to end it. Pa, uh -huh. why do- whenever I talk to Ma, you start to move. Oh, sorry. Get back to where you were! Get it here. Perfect. That's great. You can't do anything better. There's no reason why you should move. In this sense, get back to where you were has something of a double meaning. There's also a lot of criticism of corporate behavior in there. The purpose of Octan is to end the world, but that's in some way better than real life corporations whose purpose appears to be to grow endlessly without reason nor conscience. Money is no reason, but anything on the path to profit must be steamrolled. Bad Cop is ordered to kill his parents, but his superego does not let him. Thus, it is destroyed. This is how cops are made in real life. Lord Business believes that everything is his stuff, even though the world is neither his nor just stuff. It's the cringe kind of materialism prioritizing stuff, specifically the ownership of it. Don't know what the fuck is up with the dude throwing the tomahawk. Build something simple. Okay. Like an awesome race car. Great. Go. Do you have the instructions? No. You must create the instructions in your mind, my liege. Huh. Okay. Race car. Um, well, there's a lot of really cool stuff here. Don't see a wheel or... Three more wheels. The way Lucy shakes her head here is really good. You really do sympathize with her shock at Emmett's hopelessness. The simulated universe of Lego sees the assembler as God. The hand of God Emmett produces from his mind is evidently a reference to the invisible hand of the free market. Seriously though, knowing that people are behind the plot makes it feel so much more personal. It's not a story about Lego products, it's a story about people. The world of Cloud Cuckoo Land is inherently disorganized, but it is a pure utopia. It's a lawless wonderland. It is a yang without the yin. It's also fragile. The arm of the state shall run heavy upon fun havers. Cloud Cuckoo Land cannot exist. This is the naive version of communism that is so oft criticized as if it represents the true heart of the idea. Therefore, the cops destroy it. I love that the Statue of Liberty speaks French, by the way. The 1980s-something space guy, aka Benny, is voiced by Charlie Day, who is just... He is a running joke character used sparingly enough to be wonderful every time. There's also the great Morgan Freeman outtake they left in. Vitruvius! All right, you gotta write all that down because I'm not gonna remember any of it, but here we go. The speech scene is so painful. I almost want to skip it every time, but you gotta publicly humiliate yourself on occasion. I get it. We led them right to us. Guys, no, 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 I, it's not my fault. Oh, you are the worst leader I've ever seen. It's very funny that Emmett goes for the, it's not my fault. He's still a coward at this point, after all. This is a nobody who has only just started being somebody. The thing Think Tank, of course, is a nod to think tanks. Even the brightest of society are forced to produce instructions against their will, ultimately forced to kowtow to the powers that be. They play around with words a lot, the craggle being the obvious example, but here's a personal favourite. I was wrong. Ah! It's the orb of Titalis! We can't go this far without mentioning the frankly sublime Shaq joke, voiced by the man himself, of course. It's game time! Y'all ready for this? Oh no! They were ready for that! The look of the water is absolutely insane. 
I have nothing else to say. It's just painfully high effort, unreasonably good filmmaking. The way Metalbeard in particular speaks is applaudable. Did ye not hear me whole story circumscribing the folly of this whole enterprise? Emmett and his ideas possess a quality that we also see in Glass Onion. He's dumb enough to fool his way to the top. His lack of originality is the pathway to victory. When in doubt, murder the security guard. The film makes the very good decision to combine the planning and the execution of the scheme in a very tasteful montage. It would have been boring if they didn't. I love when Bruce Wayne plays on Lord Business's insecurities by getting them to make speakers. He's so desperate for any kind of approval from those he sees as cool, allowing a critical component of the scheme to work. The animation never loses its immaculate sense of pace. Speaking around the corner. Vitruvius. Good voice acting, animation, and comedic timing does not expire. Like losing his eyes, Vitruvius's death comes unexpectedly and in what appears to be a moment of victory. While it is hilarious, it's a genuinely shocking twist. The kids' movies' tropes are flipped on their head at once. Bad cop, unfortunately I'm gonna have to leave you here to die. What? Sir, It's I... not personal. It's just business. Lord business. Of course, when Bad Cop stops being useful to Lord Business, he drops him. His years of service were ultimately worthless. The police act merely as a protectorate of the state. When their usefulness expires, so does their worth. There is no time to ruminate in bitch. It's time to kill yourself. Once Wildstyle stages a coup through the TV, the revolution begins. Yay! It is here, when we are graced with one of the most hilarious, cathartic, and insurmountably joyous moments in cinematic history. I'm going to show you the whole thing because I love you. I could, uh, I could build a... I could build a... I could build a spaceship! You, you're, you're not... You're not gonna say no? Build away, whatever your name is. <laughs> All units, attack that spaceship! Special! Where'd he go? Special! Benny gets everyone back to Bricksburg with the unstoppable power of autism. Lo, the uprising is swiftly brought to heel using the wretched machinery of the state. Boo! Emmett enters a K-hole. He realizes the true nature of reality and we're introduced to our two real-world actors. Will Ferrell has an incredibly commanding presence, hilarious though the costuming may be. I really like this moment of technobabble. You, you know the rules, this isn't a toy! Um, um, it kind of is. No, actually it's a highly sophisticated interlocking brick system. I love the reveal that there are more craggles than we ever thought. In leveling the character of Emmett up, it too levels up the threat of the man upstairs. We realize at this time that the thing that we thought made Emmett special turns out to be almost irrelevant. He needs to find another way. He needs to cooperate with the main villain. Got glue all over that construction worker. Here, give that to me. Always stuck out to me. He says here when taking something from him. Finn, did you make all of this? The true turning point of the movie for me is when Will Ferrell realizes his son is extremely talented and that he's stifling his son's own creativity by locking all of these bricks into place. Emmett exits the K-hole, gets good in one of the most pleasing action scenes I've ever witnessed, and gets himself face to face with Lord Business. After a brief altercation, the power of the special is revealed. The power to turn hearts and minds towards sympathetic ends. Thank the man upstairs, Lord Business is an actual person who is not meant to represent corporations as a concept. On subsequent rewatches, I think the ending is stronger than I initially thought. It was the only way to incorporate the man upstairs angle, and the child actor wasn't as shitty as they often are. Props to him. The thing that troubles me most about the ending is that it does not present a suitable alternative to the ultra-authoritarian capitalism of the Bricksburg of yore. After everyone hugs and congratulates themselves on ending capitalism, 
we are immediately met with an even bigger threat. Women! This dodges the question that Zizek poses to anti-capitalists. What happens on day one after the revolution? But in a pretty smart way. It says that once we overcome the great challenges of our time, we will immediately be met with a bigger challenge. In a sense, capitalism is presented as a hyper-object, something that seems utterly immovable. The Lego movie says that it can, however, be beaten with the all-important human connection, humility, and collaboration. Both individual and collective action is required to dismantle the corporo-state machinery and create a more free, more equal, more culturally diverse society. Do we ever see the fruits of this, though? Is Middle Zealand literate? Is Cloud Cuckoo Land reconstructed? The movie says simply, the struggle continues. The worst thing this movie did was inspire shite like the Playmobil movie, but it's not their fault whatsoever. One good film is worth a thousand bad ones. Barbie tried desperately to do what this film did, and was not nearly as successful, even though it had three times the budget and ten years of hindsight. The self-aware corporate advertisement movie is now a well-established phenomenon, and it is almost never done well. If it capitulates to established norms, it is boring. I will not be talking about the Lego Movie 2 because I haven't seen it and I don't want to. The Lego Batman movie was pretty great, the Lego Ninjago movie was mediocre as all hell, but the original Lego movie is fucking excellent. It's a children's movie that proves you don't have to be unimaginative to be successful. The end credits are absolutely awesome, by the way. Genuine stop motion never gets old. Every frame drips with love, planning, and hard fucking work. It's rendered inarguable that making good movies, making good art, is a team effort.